Hey everybody, Brad here with a guest on the show today to have a debate slash conversation about President Biden and the Democrats' new legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act. With me is Noah Smith. He is a blogger and former economics professor, center-left policy wonk, who you might know from Twitter, used to be a Bloomberg columnist, all sorts of things all over the internet. Noah, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, look, I really appreciate it because... I have reached out to a lot of left of center people over the years to try to have conversations slash debates. And I'm far from like the most hostile or aggressive or trolly person on the right. And I've gotten like, I count on one hand, the number of people that are actually down to do it. So just on that alone, I appreciate you. Well, thank you. I, I'll debate anyone, you know, because I, I, uh, I try to get Ben Shapiro to debate me and he promised to and then and then backed out. Uh, it was going to be really fun because I was going to talk super fast like he does. And it would be like a... About what? Um, oh, I don't even remember. That was like two years ago. So then it was during uh, during the pandemic. Well, I wish he had done it. Uh, that's a real shame. Um, but so, folks, we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, what I would say is an aspirational title, uh, that the Democrats have passed. It looks set to become law. Hasn't quite yet. Uh, but just a quick overview of what's in the bill to set the ground for this conversation. The Nonpartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget says that it has about 800 and uh, I'm sorry, 485 billion in new spending, 385 billion in green energy subsidies and tax credits, 100 billion in healthcare subsidies and a few other things. Then it's got about 790 billion in projected reduced spending slash increased revenue. 320 billion from reduced healthcare spending uh, via the repeal of a Trump era rebate rule and Medicare drug price controls, and 315 billion from a 15% minimum tax on American corporations, 125 billion in projected increased tax revenue from funding the IRS and increasing enforcement. So, Noah, just feel free to let me know if there's anything in the bill that, that I didn't highlight there specifically. We can get into all the weeds. But more importantly, are you willing to admit, as some people in the kind of media are starting to, that this is really a climate bill? It's not an inflation bill, really. That, that They kind of slap that name on it for political reasons. Yes and no. I mean, climate is, is obviously a big part of it. But uh, note that it has a bunch of fossil fuel uh, stuff in it. Um, as well. So it's not really, I think that climate activists are very happy about the green energy subsidies, but I think they're kind of overestimating the degree to which it's like a pure climate bill. This is not like a, a green new deal. This is not what they had hoped for. Um, it's the best we're going to get in that sense. But so it's, it's in addition to a climate bill, it's two other things. Number one, it's a, uh, it's a cheap energy bill. It's basically, we had high gas prices, expensive energy, and, um, and so it's basically saying, let's make energy cheap. And then uh, in addition to that, it's a um, it's sort of a cost uh, cost of living reduction bill, because have you seen that um, that graph, the, the, the most important economic graph in the world that the American Enterprise Institute puts out? It's like showing how the expensive of, cost things, of things and the subsidized things. Yeah, that's right. And so I think that this is this is looking at that kind of thing and saying, holy crap we've got to do something about this. And it, it is, you know, it's a, it's a start at addressing the kind of the, the cost of living. You know, when I was when I was a kid in the 90s, things in America were pretty cheap. Gasoline was cheap. Uh, housing was cheap. Uh, healthcare wasn't cheap. But then um, it was, you know, tuition wasn't cheap either. But they were less, less horribly expensive than now. And so I think that um, uh, basically, we've got to do something about that. And I think this starts to, to get at that. So I think it's cost of living reduction, um, uh, cheap energy, which I guess is, you know, that's that's cost of living because we could always use cheaper energy and then climate. I yeah, so I, I, I see what you're saying. And I think we can debate the provisions of this bill. No, Siri, I'm not talking to you. Uh, we can debate the provisions of this bill, but I think that they are rather divorced from the macroeconomic inflation that we are seeing, right? The consumer price index year over year, what 20 in 2021, I think the average household was something like $5,000 to maintain their same standard of living. This is every voter's number one issue, but you've got all these uh, different, you know, everyone from the nonpartisan congressional budget office to the Wharton School of Business has concluded that the Inflation Reduction Act would have a statistically insignificant 
for, according to the Wharton School of Business, impact on inflation. Then CBO says that in 2022, it would have no impact. In 2023, inflation would be between 0.1 percentage point lower and 0.1 percentage higher. I mean, this doesn't address yeah. the fundamentals this is absolutely, of inflation. Absolutely accurate. Absolutely. That, the, the, these things are right. In the, in the next five years, this is going to do bupkis in terms of inflation. This is going to do nothing. So isn't that kind of a slap in the face then when voters are so upset about inflation, you're saying this is the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's not actually going to do anything in the short term? No, because the job of uh, that's the Fed's job and the Fed's doing its job like the, the you know, we, we make all these goofy memes on Twitter about dark Brandon, but it's actually just the Fed, right? The Fed raised interest rates and signaled that it was ready to raise interest rates more and and you know, people stopped overpaying as much for stuff and inflation started moderating. Today, we had the this, um, this uh, you know, a, a new data point that said that prices didn't increase at all over the last month. That's encouraging. Of course, we'll need to look at several months to see if that is sustainable. But uh, the, the simplest explanation is that the Fed is starting to have an effect. It's not just the Fed either. There's some easing in commodity markets supply chains and blah, blah, bullshit. But um, it's mainly the Fed uh, raised interest rates, said they were going to raise interest rates more. And this is their job. You know, this is why we have an independent central bank. It's what we did with Volcker in the 1980s that gave us decades of low stable inflation. Um, it's it basically the Fed is what reduces inflation. What the this the Inflation Reduction Act, that name is marketing. But it's fine with me because really, in people's minds, I don't think that the, the, the sort of inflation that's been caused in the last two years, right? I don't think that that is necessarily distinct from the longer term increases in the cost of health care, in the cost of housing, uh, you know, that they've been experiencing for decades now and that have been eroding, you know, their their ability to pay. And so I, I think that in, in the public's minds, the idea of macroeconomic inflation and this idea of increased long term cost of living rises is not necessarily separate. People are just mad that stuff's expensive. So while the Fed, whose job it is to address the short term, addresses the short term, I think the the um, Congress, you know, is now addressing the longer term stuff that we should have addressed years ago. But we had a pandemic and all this other stuff that got in the way and blah, blah, blah. And um Anyway, so I think that's what's going on. So so there's long term cost of living and short term, you know, inflation, macro inflation are actually different things. But I'm not sure the public cares whether those are different things. So I'm fine with this name. So I guess, look, I agree with you that the Fed is the biggest player here. Free marketeers have always said that monetary policy is like, uh, I don't think it's Fed, right. literally true. Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like all these guys would basically say when there's inflation. The Fed tightens. I mean, those guys would put it in terms of lowering the money supply, which we're also doing, by the way. Uh, M2 is going way down. But then, you know, usually we talk about in terms of interest rate hikes, but really those are the same thing, um, uh, more or less. And so we're doing and, and we're doing both of those. So, the, yeah, the Fed it, libertarians have always thought that the Fed's job is to control inflation. And that's exactly what it's doing. And I think this month showed the first sign that it's starting to work. And look, I don't even necessarily disagree with that, though I think that they're fixing a problem that they help create. Uh, right. But what I guess what I would say is that you call it marketing. To me, it feels deeply cynical and almost insulting to tell people who are struggling. This is the and if you look at the by the White House's statements, you look at statements from Democratic leaders, they're essentially saying we're here to help. This legislation is here to fix the inflation that's in front of you right now. And it's not. And to me, maybe you're just think that's politics as usual. But to me, it does. If, I get it that it's marketing, but I also think it's a lie. Uh, I mean, I just, I just sort of, I, I leave that to the politicians. You know, it's like, I um, if I were were you know the the benevolent dictator trying to write policy all by myself and give it a name, I would call it the you know like awesome investment act or something like that. But. But I, you know, like I don't get to do that. I just get to look at what they're putting on the table and look at the substance of it and try to not get hung up on the names of things and look at the substance and say, is this actually going to address the things that people really do care about as far as we can tell? And I think people really do care about 
cost of living. People really care that they're that shit's expensive, you know, healthcare is expensive and housing is expensive and all these things. People care about this expense. They want that to, to stop. They want that to go away. In America, we are used to having stuff, lots of stuff. We're used to having big houses and fast cars and cheap gasoline and big screen TVs and blah, 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 blah. And we've gotten away from that in the last 20 years, but really even longer than, than 20 years. We've gotten away from that, and Americans are starting to feel cramped. They're starting to feel deprived. They're starting to feel like they have to live in the, live in the pod and eat the bugs, as the uh, Twitter saying goes. You know, and I think that, that that's bad. And, that's, uh, and when we look at the numbers, we see there's a real reason for that feeling. Like, yes, real incomes have gone up more than the lefties say. They're, they exaggerate that a lot. But, but at the same time, ri massively rising costs of living, especially for health care, but also for, for housing, um, have – well, housing has kept pace with wages when it should have fallen. We should have gotten cheaper housing. Instead, housing is the same price that it was in, like, 1970-something in terms – as a percent of your, your income for an average person. And health care is many times more. And so if you'll notice, this bill has a lot of stuff to, to curb the cost of health care. Um, this bill has, uh, you know, like drug price negotiations and, and stuff like that. And that, um, you know, I, I, I think it's just a start and it's too focused on just pharmaceutical companies instead of like MRIs and specialist appointments and all the other stuff in our healthcare system that's pretty wasteful. But it's broadly the approach that successful countries use. Um, which is basically just negotiate down the prices. Use, use, uh, that it's, it's not a libertarian solution. That's not a libertarian solution at all, but it seems to work. And when you look at countries like Japan and Korea that have low healthcare expenditures, but get, you know, better results than we do. I mean, you know, sure, they're, they're, they're not as fat as we are, or, you know, obviously, like we eat too much. <laughs> we, uh, we're fat, but um, some of us, <laughs> but, then, uh, but um but they get really good results by having the government basically negotiate down prices. And when we look at it, we see that, you know, an MRI, a routine MRI that would cost like $300 in another country is costing $3,000 in America. There's no way that's all just due to like our slightly higher labor costs. Like it's, there's weird stuff going on there. And so, so I think that this is a step toward negotiating down the prices. And I think that Although it's not a libertarian solution, I think libertarians have a reason to be happy about this because the Obamacare approach, which was slightly continuing with increased Obamacare subsidies, the Obamacare approach is to throw more money at this problem, to throw more money into the healthcare system, to tax, you know, the tax the people and just push that money toward healthcare and say, here, we'll pay for your stuff more. Right. And we're do it, it, this bill does a little bit of that. It has a little bit of Obamacare subsidy increase. And, including for high income households. Yes. And that's and that's that's not good. That shouldn't have been in the bill. Um, that was probably a horse trading thing. It's not very large. Um, it's 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 a small amount, but it's I don't like that. But um, but that whole approach of of limit supply subsidized demand uh, is what the Niskanen Center has called cost disease socialism. They have this whole report called cost disease socialism, which is basically and uh, and that that phrase I. I don't actually know who came up with that. Um, I first heard it from Mark Andreessen, but it's the idea of uh, limit limit supply, subsidized demand. We've seen this with college too, right? Uh, we we have a set number of colleges, and we just keep giving people these cheap under market loans with which they can pay for. And what do you think happens to tuition? Up, 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 right? Like it's it's. I, I don't always. I don't like when people run around saying it's econ one hundred and one, but this is econ one hundred and one, you know. And so <laughs> there really is. So, um, <laughs> so then I don't, so yeah, I don't want to anyway. get, uh, I, I don't want to go too deep into the healthcare piece of it because I'm hardly an expert on that. I will just say that in terms, my understanding of how the price controls works, and I'm reporting on a piece on this. So I've been speaking to a couple different healthcare policy analysts is that it caps co-pays, but not actually the price. So for example, you can't pay on insulin. You can't pay more than $35 as the consumer on your copay. But that doesn't mean the actual price. It means that Medicare picks up the rest of the price. So in terms of essentially, I just don't want people to think that there's no downsides. They're still the same costs. They're just being shifted to taxpayers. Well, not necessarily. So when you look at when you look at the exact same service uh, between Medicare and private 
you know, payers, which could include out of pocket or could include like a private insurance company. Uh, what you see is that Medicare will get the same service for about half the price that the private payers is it, do. Aren't the private sector being forced to subsidize right now? Right. So but Medicare has, forces you to take 60%. Right. So that's called cost shifting. And there is a bit of that going on. So it's not the difference isn't really fully half. It's probably more like a third lower best estimate. Um, but so basically, but, but Medicare still does get a better price, even once you account for that, that cost shifting effect, it gets a much better price. And the reason is just is, uh, again, Econ 101, it's just called monopsony powers. M Medicare is this big buyer who can just come in and say, hey, you know, I like, I am altering the deal. Pray I do not alter it further. It's like, um, you know, that's, that's what Medicare, the Medicare system does. And if you look at the systems of Japan and Korea, they have something that's like Medicare for everybody, not Bernie's Medicare for all quote unquote plan, but they have something that's more like our Medicare system applied to the whole country, where basically the government pays 70% of whatever, of whatever you do, the government will pay 70%. And then you use private insurance or out of pocket for the other 30%. That's what they do. And that's a similar in the ballpark of, of Medicare, because Medicare doesn't pay everything. You, you have like private insurance called Medigap. Um, and then you, you have some out of pocket costs as well. Medicare does, it's not like a Bernie, you know, like free everything for everybody, no out of pocket cost kind of plan. But so what they, they do that. And, but because that government insurer is, has, you know, is paying for part of every service, it's able to negotiate the price. And so the government health insurance system basically says, guess what? We're not paying that price. That's too high. We're paying a lower price. Thank you. And so that's, and they get, they get cheaper stuff and it's really high quality and, and amazingly that works. And so our, this, this bill is like a step toward that. Um, and it's, it's, really a diametrically opposed idea than the idea of just subsidize it, have the government pick up more of the tab, because that's just going to pump up the price. Right. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. I think let's put a pin in that. I want to talk more about the green energy subsidies that are in this. Uh, the That's the biggest piece, first of all, uh, of this entire thing. And I guess um, before we go anywhere with it, it's not just green energy, it's fossil fuel. Um, let's let's start the the baseline here is I think climate change is a real problem. I think humans contribute to climate change. Um, but why do we need to massively subsidize green energy when we could just deregulate nuclear? Uh, oh, because so the problem with with deregulating nuclear. Uh, so so nuclear is fine and good, but um, it unfortunately doesn't look like it has a learning curve. That's really the key um, anymore. Um, it sort of did at, at the very beginning when it came out, but then that learning curve stopped in like the 70s. And this is when you look at Korea and China and other places that basically not just deregulate nuclear, but say they, they really push nuclear, you see that their costs aren't going down as they build more. Their costs are going up as they build more. Uh, South Korea was getting pretty, you know, cheaper costs than other countries for a while. And now their costs are going up too. And it's a big problem. You don't want like energy sources where the more you build, the more the cost goes up are, are, we can do that if we have to. That's like a desperate stopgap. But um, oh, by the way, also, you know, I don't want to jump around too much, but you, you talked about deregulating nuclear, but it turns out that nuclear has this cost structure problem of a nuclear plant costs a shit ton. Um, an upfront, all upfront sunk costs, which, and that entails into enormous risk, of course, for a project when you have this, you have to pay billions and billions of dollars like upfront for this thing that's supposed to pay off over 40 years, which is more than the investment horizon of most investors. And so what you see in practice in America, in every other country as well, nuclear always is heavily state supported. And in America, like essentially all our nuclear plants were built with government support and guarantee and loan guarantees, subsidized loans and things like that. The government had to get in on that. Even companies like GE and Westinghouse were unable, even, even back in the sixties before people cared, you know, uh, it was very difficult for G and Westinghouse to finance. And, and, and this is before Three Mile Island, before Chernobyl, before all the, the freakouts over nuclear waste and all that stuff that we know about. Even before that, government was footing a large amount of the bill and a, lar a large amount of the financing for these nuclear plants because the private sector just kind of couldn't handle it. Uh, it was just it was just too big of a, of a big upfront fixed cost. And so so nuclear has always been this very statist sort of energy source. You can't just deregulate it and then people like build nukes in their backyard. It turns out that government has always been required to guarantee it, even when you have the very largest of companies. 
And so that's that's a thing we need to think about about nuclear. But I don't want to get sidetracked too much. Um, the the real point the 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 real killer here is that um, solar and batteries are on this amazing uh, learning curve, which means that the more we build of them, the cheaper they get. Solars come down. Solar modules come down in price by about. 80% a decade, batteries come down in price by about 80% a decade. Uh, other solar balance of system costs come down by like, you know, 50% a decade or something like that. And that's that's pretty amazing. And when you look at the details of it, like why is this happening? You see that most of it's just economies of scale. You build bigger solar plants um, and they get cheaper. And so the more we build, the more the, the cheaper stuff gets. And that's Ultimately, that's the only way we're going to be able to solve climate change, because if you look at emissions, if you look at carbon emissions, America is is at most 14 percent of carbon emissions. Right. And that number shrinks every year. We are one seventh of the carbon put out in the world. And so if when America shrinks our own carbon emissions by 10 percent, you know, we're talking about a one point four percent decrease in global emissions. That's it's not a lot. Right. And so, well, that's kind of what I was going to ask you is how can we ask taxpayers to be on the hook for hundreds of billions in investment when the U.S. could stop all carbon emissions tomorrow, go to zero, which this wouldn't even come close to doing. China and India are going to keep pumping away. It wouldn't make much of a difference in the global trajectory. You can look at the IPCC numbers on this. I mean, you're talking a fraction of a degree Celsius that it would make in the difference if we went to zero emissions. So I'm almost, Absolutely. I don't mean to be nihilistic, but like, what is the point? Right. And I, I'll say exactly what the point is. The point here is that the only way that we can, so, so people talk about stuff like moral leadership. If we decarbonize, other people imitate us. Bullshit. They will not. Um, <laughs> that's just that's just a thing that does not happen otherwise like sweden would have we would have all be following sweden's lead or whatever right um but we're not uh but anyway the real the real effect comes from making these technologies cheaper china and india are only going to do what's in their own economic best interest and if what's in their economic best interest is to ditch coal plants and go with renewables instead they will do it out of pure economic self-interest. And so what we can do to push the whole world, and that goes also for Africa and Southeast Asia and every other developing country, you know, there's no, there's no reason they have to industrialize using the same path of coal that we did and China did. Um, and so, so what we, our, our contribution to global emissions reduction has to be through technology. That's the only real way. And the way that we make technology cheaper is with these learning curves, is we install more of it really quickly and the price goes down. And then everyone, uh, you know, sort of sort of learns how to do that. Um, and then. Yeah, look, I think that is the steel man of the argument. I had this conversation with my boyfriend, actually, and he made that point is that short term, I don't think we're going to be able to make a difference. But if we really advance this technology, then it could spread globally. Right. And, that, and I wrote a blog post um, today and, that's ex making exactly that argument. Great, and I'll, I can throw that in, in the show notes. Um, but I guess that that that's a very optimistic point of view, in my view, right? Because I'm I don't think the federal government is particularly good at picking winners and losers. I think every time they're handing out hundreds of billions of dollars in green energy subsidies, that's going to go to the firms with the best lobbyists more than it's going to go to the most promising technology. I'm I think we'll end up with tons of cylindras from this because this is a, a huge handout from people who don't understand the basics of this. I mean, members of Congress, how writing this legislation, how much of the actual science and industry insight are they going to have and how much of it's going to be ultimately political spending motivated by lobbying, by constituency interests, things like that. All right. Well, so so a couple of things. One is the the tax credits in the bill, the like which is most of the spending, are not subsidies for individual companies. It's not like the government walks to you and say, "Hey, you're a solar company. Have some money." It doesn't even pay the solar company. What it pays is the consumer of the solar. So basically, whoever you are, and it doesn't matter what company you are, you can just go get this tax credit and you can just write a little thing to the IRS and you say, hey, look. But it's a little more complicated than that. Like the EV credits, some companies like Tesla in the past have not not applied for them and others have, right? So, right. So the EV stuff, um, 
I mean, it depends. Like there is the definition of what constitutes a, a vehicle, but but so so when we're talking about EV tax credits, we're talking about if you buy an EV, you pay less taxes. You know, if you if you're a tra trucking company or if you're a uh, I guess I guess EV trucks aren't that popular, but suppose you're like a car rental company, right? And you buy EVs instead of gas cars, you get a big fat tax credit. If you're a pizza delivery company, if you are anyone who owns a bunch of cars, or if you're just like regular people, obviously, who buy most of the cars, you get a tax credit. And that money, yes, some of it's going to go to Tesla, some of it's going to go to GM, some of it's going to go to whoever makes electric cars. But ultimately, whoever sells electric cars is going to get it because they get it indirectly, right? They don't, it's not like the government walks up to Elon Musk and says, hey, Elon Musk, here's a check. They hand what they do is they tell Elon, they tell potential Elon customers, if you buy electric vehicles, you get to save some money and then they buy them and then Elon makes some money. But if he's outcompeted by other companies, then he's outcompeted by other companies. And so, it, but my, my point is that electric vehicles might not be the most promising way to reduce emissions or invest in climate, because for example, where does the electricity come from to run the electric vehicles? And so they're shifting the focus to EVs with this huge subsidy that is mostly going to flow to high income Americans, if we're being honest. Poor people don't buy electric cars. Uh, it, it, to me, it's like, well, I yet, get what you're saying. In this case, it's a demand side subsidy. Yeah, it's a demand side but subsidy. But you can't, it, it is still going to be picking winners and losers from which technologies get That's subsidized. Right. That's exactly right. So it's it's picking winners at the level of the technology, not at the level of the company. I think that's an important distinction. So what we've seen with batteries, so so there's a there's two reasons to do this, um, and the first reason is the the learning curve. What we've seen is that in, internal combustion cars stopped getting cheaper many 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 years ago. Um, in terms of the efficiency of the technology, we're really damn good at making those kind of things. We're not getting much better. Uh, but um, uh, then there's there's hydrogen cars, which we we tried. Japan really tried to go hard for that. It didn't really work out. Um, and then there's uh, and then there's electric cars. That's all there is. There's uh, so so um, we're not picking technologies at the level of the electrical storage medium. So if you want to use a lithium iron phosphate battery, or if you want to use any other kind of battery, that the EV tax credit will apply just as much. Um, but we're we're saying electric. Electrics can work. And so the first reason is this learning curve. We've been seeing batteries and therefore electric cars get it cheaper. Batteries have been getting cheaper at, um, you know, a factor of five per decade. And since batteries are a big part of the cost of electric vehicles, that's pretty huge. Like the idea that you go down by by, by 5x, you know, you, you go down from like $100 to $20 or whatever every decade is pretty big and what we've seen is that it depends a lot on scaling it depends a lot on 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 scaling up um and so so that is really um so that's really the first reason to do it is because with with a lot of technology we haven't seen this scaling effect but with this technology we've just seen this the scaling effect so we're trying to lean on that we're trying we're picking that for fundamental scientific reasons it's like you know when you when you go build like dams you pick a technology right you're like we're going to use hydroelectric dams for things when you like decide what to pave your roads with you're picking a technology because you're deciding like are we going to pave our roads with with this topping or that topping you know and 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 japan uses a different one than us so you often have to pick these technologies um and so that's the first reason the second reason is because there's this sort of network effect so imagine if you if half our cars are gas and half our cars are electric and we've got um you know a, a patchwork of gas stations and electric stations you have range problems, right? Because you can't find the station as easily. But so if we're going to switch to a new thing, we're going to have to switch to one new thing or else everybody's going to have range problems. So uh, if we're going to switch to electric vehicles, we need charging stations on every block like we have gas stations on every block right we're we're going to need to make sure and in, you know in practice you can put a charging station next to a gas station but it does take some space and it does take some power and so we got to do it and so um there's this network effect you know so um our our constitution actually tells our government that one of its roles is to set uh like weights and measures and and you know standards uh for things and this is really in that same boat this is really in that same boat because the reason we all use the same inch 
I know no one else uses the inch. The reason we all use the same pound, you know, pound of weight, right, between everything. The reason we use these standardized things is so the reason plugs look the same in every apartment. Imagine if if different buildings and different companies built different shape plugs in different buildings. It would be nuts. You wouldn't be able to charge your device wherever you went, right? You were like, oh. It's like when you go to yeah. Europe and you forget to get the the extension. Yeah, it's horrible. Imagine if that were like building to building. <laughs> like every building were like going to Europe. That would suck. Like you'd be carrying around an adapter this big with like a million, it would, you know, it would be crazy. And so, so our government sets these standards. And if you think about it, vehicle technology has to be one of these standards. So if we're going to switch, which we need to switch, if we're going to switch, um, we should switch to this to one thing. And we and the government is the big coordinator of that because otherwise you'd need a monopoly company and 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 that's not going to happen and even if it did happen it wouldn't necessarily be good but then um the government is what coordinates that and basically says okay now we're going to go for evs and we did the same thing with gas stations actually we heavily promoted the development of gas stations back when we were switching to oil power back like in the in the days of of john d rockefeller and those guys we really like um we support gas stations a lot. And so, so that's what we're really doing here. We're saying, we're saying we need the government because we need to coordinate this switch so that people don't have range anxiety so that there's stations on every corner and they're all the same kind of station. Right. And, and we need to have interoperability so that you can, Tesla doesn't get to charge only Tesla's right. We need to have interoperability and the government has to insist on that. Otherwise Tesla might say, well, Hey, guess what guys, Tesla might decide to be like Apple, right? Apple products work with other Apple products. And so Tesla might decide to say, Hey guys, you can install this special Tesla charging station, but it's this one type of plug and no one else can use our plug. And so not even with an adapter, you can't even get the Europe box. And so, so that we don't want that. We don't want that. We want every EV to be able to charge at every EV station so that there's the biggest possible network so that no one has any range anxiety. Right. And that's that's coordination. That's why we have weights and measures and standardization in the Constitution, even in this like pre federal government, ultra libertarian moment back in like the 1700s when most of the economy was like farming. We still had the government come in. They still recognize that the government needs to solve this coordination problem. And this is all the more, with our built up industrialized stuff we have now. It's all the more important. So I think that that's what that's about fundamentally. Um, it's not like. Yeah. So setting setting weights and measures doesn't always cost 385 billion dollars i'll i'll put i'll say no, that but, it costs but something. uh i want i and want I remember to, that's over uh, 10 years that's each. a 10-year figure when you say 380 billion dollars you really mean 38 billion dollars because that's how much you spend a year right like 38 billion dollars is like the revenue of like one company it's also i mean you can put it in terms of the context you, you can put that number in a lot of context because we also spent like I, I don't have in front of me but like 40 billion on operation warp speed or something so this is a, signif- I'm it's glad a significant we did. investment i'm glad we did man i am <laughs> i am too but what i'm saying is something that important right it's, um, it's a significant so let's right. talk- it's a significant investment of 40 billion dollars it's not going to break the bank it's half of apple's annual revenue Half of Apple, half of one comp, one single company. It's half of that one company's revenue on this massive transition that's going to transform the way we get around our whole transportation, our whole lives. For half of Apple's annual revenue, I'm not, you know, like it's not nothing. It's an, I'm not going to say it's a trivial amount of money, but I'm, it's also not like 380 billion dollars. No, it's 38 billion dollars. It's because. We, we give these things in 10 year well increments. we always talk about stuff over 10 years well we don't Everyone yeah but okay then Trump's apple then apple revenue is 820 cut. billion dollars if we look at 10 years actually more because it's going to grow i guess but then um but uh yeah so then like yeah so if you want to talk about 10 year figures that's fine but then we have to put it in perspective by the things we compare it to should be in 10 year figures too so i'd like to say it's one it's one half of an apple revenue that we're spending on the whole like that we're spending in government money on the whole green energy transition and like what is in taxpayer money in taxpayer money and but but you know it's not like this is going to make taxpayers poorer because we're going to get cheap energy and cheap stuff because of it um and whether you like it or not you're going to get an ev whether you like it or not that's right i mean you, you don't have to, i don't own a car <laughs> you don't have to own a car but 
depends where you live in the country. That's, That's right. a, That might be true for people on the coasts and in the cities, but in lots of parts where I live, you have to own That's a car. True. And I actually live in a city. I live in Grand Rapids, but it's like to walk to the nearest restaurant would be like, yeah. well, there's a few, but I'm saying it, it's not, I used to live in DC. You could not own a car. Here, you could not, right. not own a car. So let's, let's agree that Grand Rapids needs to allow the construction of much more dense housing and build some trains so that people have the option not to own a car. But, and I, having, I lived in Michigan, I've been to Grand Rapids, <laughs> it, Grand Rapids I, could I, build I do up. Agree Grand Rapids could build up a lot. I, I I want to talk about the corporate minimum tax because I think you would acknowledge that anytime you spend money, you have to raise money or have debt or yeah. there's always trade-offs in policy. And the one of the biggest ways they pay for all this green energy subsidies, people could decide for themselves what they how they feel about those is through a new 15% minimum tax on American corporations. And um, I have a couple questions for you about this, but one are you willing to acknowledge that at least a significant portion of this will ultimately be borne by workers? You know, even left of center economic groups will say corporate taxes are borne by workers in part, often a majority of corporate I, no, the, taxes. The, well, I wouldn't say often a majority. The, so, so I used to think this like back when they were, you know, in 2016, I, I really did think this. And then a bunch of research came out showing that it's more like, 15 20 percent born by workers well you can find studies all over the place but even the um oh, what's the liberal one called the liberal tax group has something like a third but i guess yeah we, so i would have to quibble about the percentage because i've seen seven in recent years we did right? a bunch of corporate taxes and we could look at the impact on wages so the the reason why it was harder to evaluate in the past is because we had just hadn't done a lot of monkeying around the corporate tax rate and then we did. And so now we can get a better picture because we have that sort of experiment that we ran from Trump's tax cuts. And the numbers I'm seeing look more like 15 to 20 percent. But yeah, some some is going to get borne by workers. It's like you raise you raise taxes. That's true of anything like anything is going to get it, it's not going to get only borne by the person who has to write the check to the IRS. Things shift. So I think, you know, I've seen lots of studies that put it much higher than that, but we're not going to lit litigate yeah, the exact exactly. percentage. A significant portion, though. And so when Democrats say our bill doesn't raise taxes on any uh, American, everyday Americans, that might be literally true in like name. But the practical reality is billions of dollars of tax increases will be borne by American workers. Right. So here's the here's the deal with the 15 percent uh, minimum tax. The 15 percent minimum tax is actually a sneaky attack on monopoly. Um, because as we all know from <clears throat> Econ 101, uh, uh, in a perfectly competitive market, no company will make a profit above and beyond its own cost of capital. That's called an economic profit. So no, in, in a perfectly right. competitive market, your profit just equals your cost of capital and that's it. You're done. Um, but in a monopolistic market, companies make a ton of profit. Now, in reality, neither of those is real. You know, we don't have perfect monopolies and we certainly don't have perfect competition. And in reality, we look at most industries and we say, OK, usually you make like a five to 10 percent profit margin. And it's recently, a lot of companies have started making a lot bigger profit margins than that. And so that's their accounting profit, though, not necessarily their economic profit. That's right. That's right. So we don't. You know, we, we I, I can't tell you that every company's cost of capital is the same because companies in order to know the cost of capital, we could get technical about how we calculate that. But if you look at interest rates, if you look at the weighted average cost of capital for companies, you know, it's come way down and profits have gone way up. That's weird because profit margins have actually profits have actually like increased a lot, even though the amount that companies have to pay for capital has shrunk a ton. And because of, you know, years and years and years of low interest rates. And so, um, which, by the way, many, many libertarians have been mad about. Which is the which Fed. Which is the Fed. Which was the Fed. Because we had no inflation. We were free to just lower interest rates. And yet, and yet, cost of capital went down. And guess what? Um, the uh, um, 
profits just kept going up and up and up. And if and economists who looked at the profit share of the economy as distinct from the the capital share found that it had gone way, way, way up. And we don't know for sure, but I think at this point, it's evidence is mounting that market power, that monopoly, not monopoly, like a pure monopoly or like Carlos Slim or whatever, but like, you know, just a couple powerful companies who have much more pricing power, much more ability to set their price instead of letting the market determine their price. These companies are making a lot of profit. We think an economics, basic economic theory suggests that this is a that this is a monopoly problem and so b what we're doing sneakily with the uh with the 15 percent minimum tax and um with a couple of the other measures here in this bill is to say okay if you're one of these monopoly companies you're going to pay some tax because the monopoly companies have more profit uh that's just what you do if you if you have monopoly power if you have market power even if you're not a pure monopoly, which these companies aren't, but if you have market power, you get a profit, you get excess profit um, above and beyond your cost of capital, and then, um, and this taxes you. And it's a, it's, it's not exactly the way that I would have done it. It's a bit blunt because it doesn't focus on profit margin. It focuses on total amount of profit. Uh, so, it, but that's going to catch. But total amount of profit is going to catch very large companies, right? Large companies. And if you're a, if you're a monopoly, not a monopoly, but if you're a like oligopoly, if you're like one of these big dominant market power companies that really controls your industry a lot, you're going to be big. And your your top line, your, your absolute dollars of profit are going to be high. And you're going to have a very low cost of capital too, by the way. And so, yeah. So, so economic profit is going to be high. I think though... So it's a sneaky attack on monopoly. One of the... Yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but I guess I have a, I have a couple questions about that. One of which is that um, this this idea. So the idea of increasing taxes on business. Um, let me just read you something from the, because part of your argument in your article about the Inflation Reduction Act as to why it would lower the cost of living over time was that it would increase supply and reduce demand. Do I have that right? Increase supply and reduce demand. That's right. Uh, I don't know about reduce demand. Uh, in healthcare, yes. But increase in healthcare, supply. Healthcare reduced demand, yes. In um, in uh, increased supply. That's right. It's a supply side. Okay. Policy. But so, but hiking taxes on business reduces supply. Reading from the Congressional Budget Office, enacting the bill would also reduce some businesses' incentives to invest through changes in the after-tax return on private investment, pushing down output and inflation. I mean. In addition, they also say it will reduce incentives to work because of the health insurance subsidies. But that's set that aside for a moment. It's like a classic negative supply well, shift just say, to hike taxes on businesses. You did just say pushing down inflation. Uh, but anyway, I guess. <laughs> and, and and one of your big problems with the bill was that it was called the Inflation Reduction Act. So, <laughs> well, because it, it's negated by other okay. parts. But so I guess what I'm saying is. Um, I used to think this way, and if you look back at what I was writing in Bloomberg in 2015, 2016, I was writing this exactly what you just said. And then we did a big corporate tax cut, and our best analysis that we've got, we can look industry by industry by looking at who was able to benefit disproportionately more or less from that tax cut. So we can look at that, and our, our best analyses basically say, this didn't do nearly as much of this as as I thought it was going to, as we thought it was going to. In other words, in other words, corporate tax of 15% is, is pretty safe in terms of suppressing economic activity. I would have thought that this would have done more, but but it, from from Trump's corporate tax cut, it looks like this is not as big a deal as we thought. Yeah, no, I, I get I get what you're saying there, but I, I do think, I think it is going to be harmful. I oh, think sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think it's just the reason is that 15% isn't very high. If we went to a true 40% corporate tax rate, which we've never actually had because we used a million tax credits so that no one had to pay the headline rate. But if we did go to 40% corporate tax rate, I'd be pretty worried. But we also, but they're part of the reason that they're do, accomplishing this 15%, and I'm not an expert in the mechanics of this, is by weakening expensing provisions, correct? And those are provisions that help let them write, like the reason some companies are able to pay 0% quote unquote in taxes, though they pay other taxes, they pay lots of payroll tax, lots of other taxes, is because of provisions in the tax code that reduce their taxable income to, to nil through things like writing off big investments. 
And if they have a 15%, you are reducing that. And that's been a very pro-growth piece of the tax code, the expensing your investments. Right. Well, but the thing is that the companies that are investing a ton are generally like, so this isn't going to, this isn't going to impact like high growth companies, you know, fast growing companies, because those companies aren't making a ton of profit. The, the 15% rate is um, applied to your book income. So you've already written your investments off of that. If you have, if you make a big investment, that subtracts from your gap income, right? Your general, generally accepted accounting practices income. And so you already have written off, the, the write-offs for those investments are not going to be affected by this. What I can't find with a quick Google is whether or not accelerated uh, depreciation and you know those special kind of things we do will be affected by this um, but essentially the 15 percent is on something from which investment has already been deducted and that's why i'm not worried about what you just said but you're also you still are and cbo this is what cbo notes you're reducing the incentive to invest by reducing the return on investment maybe and that's what i think is really not uh we haven't we haven't seen much of that um, in the data, uh, Trump's corporate tax cuts did not appear to boost investment by any measurable amount. Um, there are definitely some people who would disagree with you on that. I mean, there are people who might disagree, might just say the opposite thing, but I, you know, I haven't seen an analysis yet that, that shows a positive effect. And so I would have, I would have guessed that there would be a positive effect, but, but things that push on the financial side what, what we've discovered with this and with things like dividend tax cuts, capital gains tax cuts, we've discovered that incentives on the financial side of investment don't do a very good job at affecting real business capital investment, real, you know, purchases of real capital, of structures, of, you know, making financing easier. L look, we've been doing massive financial investment tax credits for for decades upon decades now in the hopes that this would would feed through to real business investment and get businesses to invest more. And yet businesses have not invested more. Gross private domestic investment as a share of GDP is just about where it was in the 60s, whenever, 50s, 70s, anytime. Like it's always been about the same. And net, when we look at, when we cancel out depreciation, of course we don't measure depreciation, right? So this is getting a little wonky. But when you look at net domestic investment, which is what we do on top of what we need to just sort of maintain our stock, that's actually fallen, um, you know, uh, pretty steadily. And so so we're seeing, we, we've been, it, it's sort of like we're pushing on a string here. We're making it, we're increasing the after-tax return on financial investment, and it's not boosting capital investment. It's just not. And so it's time to, you know, when the, when the formula starts working, you change the formula. And, um, and I think we're, we're looking at changing the formula now. Um, in terms of, so, so to reiterate, the corporate tax is taxed on uh, profits after investment. So it's not a direct disincentive for capital investment. Um, unless it is through other policies that I, that I don't know about and can't find, but, but it's on, you, you deduct your investment from your, your book income before you pay taxes on it. But what you're talking about is that it reduces the financial investment for people to buy stocks and bonds, right? That's what you're talking about um, because you don't get as high return on stocks and bonds and then starved of financial you know inflows from stocks and bonds companies will do less real capital investment the problem is we've been th this is like a failed approach this idea that simply that simply goosing the financial returns for investors will make companies buy more buildings and factories and machinery and vehicles and computers and whatever right the idea that that works just hasn't panned out and it's time to something else and hiking their taxes by hundreds of billions will uh, i mean so that, that, I mean, let's look, that, that tax hike as well that tax hike doesn't even cancel out the amount that trump cut the tax okay the the trump tax cuts were bigger in size than what we're about to hike right now so we're not even going back to 2015 that's we're true. not even going back to 2015 so if you if you're worried about this you're worried about returning to the dark days of 2015 when our economic growth was just as fast as it's been in in any recent year if you're worried about going back to the the dark dark days of 20 
you know, 1415. I'm not. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> you know, we're not even going all the way back to the dark, oh. dark days of 2015 with these taxes. We're not even canceling out the whole Trump tax. Code. I'd like to go back to the dark, dark days of 2017. Uh, the economy was 2018. Uh, but I agree with you. 2015 would be better than they, now. They were, it was the about the same. So the everything. economic performance in, from 2013 through 2019 was quite good, but it was pretty uniform. And we didn't see we didn't really see an acceleration after you know Trump's tax cuts, although it could have been the trade war that canceled it out, blah, blah, blah. We can go back and forth on this. Well, we can agree to, to poo-poo on that. But uh, the last big piece of this package that we haven't really discussed yet is the IRS, uh, the big boost. Yeah, so, so basically there'd be uh, a huge budget increase to the IRS. Their workforce would double. Uh, they would have more than uh, employees than the Pentagon, the State Department, uh, and a couple other agencies combined, I've read. Um, I guess I'm wondering, uh, there's two pieces to this. What, I guess just what's your general thought about, uh, as some Democrats have said, beefing up the IRS and having it go beast mode? <laughs> beast mode. Um, well, the IRS is already kind of a beast. Because it's my nightmare. <laughs> I, I think it sounds like a freaking terrible well, time. Well, if, 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 you know, you know when, I was, when I was a grad student, I got audited, right? I made like 15000 a year from my little teaching stipend, and I got audited. Uh, and a very nice man came over to my house and all day. And while I did homework or, you know, watch TV, he went through a bunch of papers and stuff and occasionally asked me a question. And at the end, he left and found out that I had paid the correct amount of taxes on my $15,000 of income, which is none. So, um, uh, they're horror stories yeah, of horror many stories. people who've had terrible times with that's their right. audits. It could be a the real movie, hassle. Uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. It, that's the fundamental plot I, of the I, recent movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once. I don't know it. Oh, I recommend it. It's, it's just sort of this goofy, like 80s throwback like kind of uh, sci-fi comedy. Um, it's I'll it's check goofy, it out. but it's it's focused around these people, these small business people who are getting audited by the, a really irritating IRS auditor um, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, who ends up being like one of the main villains is the IRS. And so they go into this office just full of reams of paper. Catherine Rampell of the Washington Post just did this really interesting uh, feature where the, she and some people basically went out to some IRS offices and saw that it's just boxes of paper. So a lot of this money is going to be used to modernize things like that. So they have these on digital records instead of having like an army of people sorting through paper. Um, so a lot of it's that. The IRS, you know, the IRS is, is should go beast mode as long as it's not on like average folks but it will be uh, let me read you the from something from the joint committee on taxation yeah. uh th they say that 78 to 90 percent of the money raised from underreported income would come from those making less than two hundred thousand a year only four to nine percent would come from those making more than five hundred thousand dollars so democrats pushing this legislation are trying to say we're only gonna uh, audit the rich but a they rejected an amendment that was offered that would have restricted it to people earning more than four hundred thousand these these ramped up audits and b that's just it doesn't appear to be true i mean there's like what 700 billionaires and they're hiring eighty four thousand new irs employees over a decade they're not gonna just go after the rich they're gonna be hassling and squeezing every last nickel and dime out of all sorts of everyday people i guess i don't know um i i would focus enforcement on on the rich but i don't think this bill I don't does know, that I, I, yes and i don't know if the bill specifies who's going to be focused on so one thing that one thing that annoys me about this is that yes this may be a good point yes this may be a problem but i'm not sure the people who are claiming that it's going to be targeted toward this or that group, that's not written into the bill. You know, they're just throwing a bunch of money at the IRS and essentially letting the IRS decide what to do with it and, you know, kind of trying to make a guess about what the IRS will do with it. And to be honest, like, but, the, but if you look at the bill, it doesn't say audit this many people at this income level, this many people that it just doesn't do that. It doesn't have rules like that. But we can infer from what they have done to historically, can we? They, can we? they audit people who aren't rich much more than they do the rich because auditing lower income people is way easier. They don't have armies of tax accountants and lawyers. OK, fine. Um, but, and, but and so historically, we don't know that that's um, we don't know that's going to hold. So so increasing the budget of the IRS might could cause two things. Number one, they could do more of the same pattern they do now and go after more low income people because it's cheaper per person or 
they could use the money to switch from going after low-income people to going after high-income people while going after approximately the same number of people that they currently go after because it's much more difficult and expensive to go after the higher income people so they use the extra money we give them to switch who they go for thus taking pressure off the poor people either of those is possible i guess that's not what joint committee on taxation either of those is possible so the, do, look I, I mean I, I know how those estimations are done right you assume in in econ i get to pretend to be an economist for five seconds here you assume that a certain parameter is structural you assume that this certain number doesn't change right and that number is the the number they're assuming doesn't change is the the distribution of who gets audited. But that's not a good assumption because the IRS can, it's, it is possible, and this is what Larry Summers, for example, advocates, they can use the money to go after the same number of people, but just shift the, the people, the, the go after rich people instead of poor people. That costs money. Shifting from going after the poor to going after the rich costs money. And where are they going to get that money? Inflation Reduction Act. So... I guess what I'm saying is that, like, we don't know how the IRS is going to use the money, and it's theoretically possible, and I'm worried that they'll use it for the wrong thing, as you're talking about. That does worry me, but it's also possible that they'll use it to take pressure off poor people, because, as you said, it's more expensive to audit a rich person than a poor person, and they need money for that. So I agree that it's possible. I don't think it's probable, and I guess one difference between us is perhaps you're more willing to assume good faith from the IRS than I am, because what I look at is... I view it as an institution devoid of credibility uh, because of the Obama era scandal where it targeted conservative groups, lowest learner, and people weren't held accountable for that. And then more recently, IRS employees leaked the, the private confidential tax information of some wealthy Americans, illegally leaked it to score, you know, the whole ProPublica thing it, to make a partisan like tax the rich political point. A bunch of IRS employees leaked this document. I think that the idea that we should give them tons of money and trust them that they're going to do something good and not bad, it, to me, I'm not on board with that. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, I worry about it, but also since it's not written into the law what the IRS does with this money, we can pass another bill that actually includes that if we if if this negative consequence happens and if they start going. If they use the money to harass a bunch of normal folks, I'm sure Republicans will cooperate with a bipartisan bill to say, no, IRS, you've got to use this money to go after richer folks instead. They offered it an amendment. Democrats rejected it. Really? But, OK. Yeah, but, there was an amendment. <laughs> I think if if this negative consequence materializes and people get mad, we can do that. That's. See, I think I guess we we disagree. I think you have to have that in writing first. I would have I would have preferred to get it in huge chunks I, of I money. I agree with you that I would have preferred to get that in writing first. All right. Well, everybody, those are our thoughts about the inflation Inflation Reduction Act. Let me know in the comments on this video, the response to this podcast, what you think. And I, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. This Absolutely. was a blast, everybody. I'll put links to Noah's Twitter and Substack. Uh, Noah, thank you so much for coming Absolutely. on and having this chat. I'll come back anytime.